I'm going to talk about a truly excellent paper uh, entitled SDSS4 Manga, The G-Dwarf Problem Revisited. Did you write this paper? As it happens, I did. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I saw, well, I saw actually, that coming. <laughs> to be fair, it's actually the work of one of my PhD students, a guy called Mick Greener, and various of my colleagues around Nottingham and in other places as well. But yes, I'm one of the people involved in this. Excellent. Conflict of interest, but we've dealt with it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, no, I'm hugely conflicted. But once in a while when you're doing astronomy, you find something that nobody else ever knew before. And you just get that kind of warm feeling about knowing something about the universe that nobody else knows. It's, it's why I do research. <laughs> oh, there we go. Tell me about what's going on. Yeah, well, so we need to talk about the G-Dwarf problem first, um, which is, as with most things in astronomy, a misnomer in that it's not really much to do with G-Dwarfs and it's not really a problem. And to talk about it, we need to think a bit about star formation. The simplest picture that you could have of star formation is you start with a big blob of gas and it just starts producing stars. Right? And some of them turn into stars. And of course, if you started out with just primordial gas, so basically just hydrogen and helium from the universe, that first generation of stars will just be hydrogen and helium. But pretty quickly, the most massive stars that get made will blow up a supernova, they'll create some heavy elements from the nuclear processes that are going on within them, and they'll start polluting the environment with heavier elements, which means that the next generation of stars that form start having some heavier elements in them, they'll then do the same thing, enhance the heavier elements a bit more, blow up a supernovae, and so on. And so you have a whole series of generations of stars, each one slightly more heavy elements than the previous. And in fact, we don't find any stars. You know, we can't find that first generation of stars. There's so few of them, if they even still exist, compared to everything that we find since, that actually you don't find any with no metallicity, no heavy elements at all. So I will keep referring to metallicity. That's Astronomers like to annoy chemists by referring to everything heavier than helium as a metal. And so metallicity just means the amount of heavy elements in something. The other thing that can happen, of course, is if you just have this simple picture of a kind of isolated blob of gas. So what's referred to as the closed box scenario, where you've just got just this gas and nothing else. Of course, you're going to run out of gas. And so you'll start making stars and make more and more stars. But then pretty quickly, you'll have turned it all into stars and there won't be any more stars that get made. One of the things you can do is say, OK, so in that scenario, what kind of distribution of heavy elements would you expect? Would you expect to find lots of stars with little heavy elements and not many stars with lots of heavy elements? Or would you expect to find very few stars with not much by way of heavy elements and lots of stars with lots of heavy elements in? And it turns out, at least in that simple picture, you can actually just do the calculation. And the answer is that you would expect to see lots of stars without much by way of heavy elements in them. And the reason why it works out that way is because you start turning this gas into stars and so those first generations of stars don't have much by way of heavy elements in them. By the time you've got enough heavy elements made to make stars with lots of heavy elements in them, there isn't much gas left. And so you don't end up making very many stars that way. So pictorially, there's a way of showing this. So here's a figure. I was hoping for some really cool three-dimensional box with colours and gases, but I've just no, got no, two lines. No, no, very simple. You know, this is a very simple model, so it's a very simple calculation. And this is basically saying how much mass is there in stars that have less than some metallicity Z as a function of that metallicity Z. And what this is saying is that in this closed box model, so the blue line on here, you start making lots and lots of stars with not much by way of heavy elements, but then you don't add many more stars at heavier elements. So you end up with a curve that looks like that. Unfortunately, that's not what you see in the Milky Way. If you look at the Milky Way, and in particular, the first place people looked at this was at G-dwarfs. This is why it gets called the G-dwarf problem. So the sun's a G-dwarf. It's not specific to G-dwarf. There are lots of G-dwarfs out there, so they're easy stars to look at. They are unevolved stars, so they haven't kind of stirred up all their own insides. They haven't generated lots of heavy elements of their own. What you see on the surface of a G-dwarf is pretty much what that star was made of. So they're good from that point of view, and they're bright enough to see a reasonable distance away. The picture we said is, what we naively expect is you'd expect lots of things without much by way of heavy elements in them and not very many with lots of heavy elements in them. Yeah. What you find in the Milky Way is completely the opposite. So in general, stars in the Milky Way are more polluted than you would have expected. Exactly so. The simplest way it turns out to fix this is instead of having this thing called the closed box, you can have a thing called an accreting box, which is just basically you start out with a certain amount of gas, you start turning it into stars, but as time goes on, you feed more gas in. And it turns out that fixes the problem. Naively, you might expect it would make things worse because you're feeding in primordial gas. So this is gas which hasn't been polluted at all. 
you'd think that would actually end up making more stars with little by way of pollution. But actually it turns out it has the opposite effect. And the reason is because your closed box is quite good at making the heavy elements. So you've got lots of heavy elements around, you just haven't got enough mass around to make more stars. Yeah. And so the, the accreted material just kind of gives you the extra material you need to start making those stars with more heavy elements in them, more polluted stars. So it's almost like your closed box later in life is saying, I could make loads of polluted stars if you just give me a bit more gas to make stars with. And exactly. it's like, oh, here we go, let's exactly. pour some in. The box is now full of fruit and currants. It just hasn't got any flour to make more cakes with. Perfect. Yes. So yes, you've got all the you've got the, the fun ingredients, but you just haven't got the basic raw material to bulk it up to make stars with. And so that's what the the red line here shows is just what would happen if you have this accreting uh, box model and it's you can see it's doing the opposite thing right the blue line where you didn't have that material you made lots of these stars with without much by way of pollution in them and very few got added later on here you can see you make fewer stars without much heavy elements in them but you've got plenty of material at the end to make lots of stars that have heavy elements in them and that solves the problem for the milky way right that actually if we say okay maybe the milky way wasn't one of these closed boxes we know it's not the closed box because we can see things smashing into it maybe just more and more material was getting added to it maybe that's the solution the neat part is we can now kind of do the same thing in external galaxies with this survey Mango, which I talked about a bunch of times before, where basically we're taking spectra across the faces of galaxies. We can play these clever games of actually splitting that light up and saying, okay, we can see the spectrum at each point in this galaxy. How much of that spectrum looks like it comes from stars with high metallicities, intermediate metallicities, low metallicities. So let me show you the same kind of plot that we had before. But now for a whole bunch of galaxies and, and we've kind of combined galaxies together. So the red line here is what we find for the most massive galaxies all the way up to the purple line, which is what we find for the least massive galaxies, all kind of averaged together in those different masses. And what we find is that for, for massive galaxies like the Milky Way, we had exactly the same picture as, as for the Milky Way, that you need this accreting box explanation because there aren't very many stars. Uh, at low metallicity and there are lots and lots of stars at high metallicity. Yeah. So it looks like the Milky Way is, is absolutely typical for its kind. There's nothing weird going on with the Milky Way. The more interesting thing though is as we go down in mass and look at lower and lower mass galaxies, when you look at the lowest mass galaxies, which is the purple one here, there they look very much like the closed box, right? That actually there are lots and lots of stars that are formed with these low metallicities, so the curve goes up very quickly to start with and then we don't add very many more when we get to the higher metallicities. So it looks like low mass galaxies really do behave as if they were kind of closed boxes, that you don't actually have to keep adding mass to a low mass galaxy to explain its distribution of metallicities, whereas high mass galaxies like the Milky Way, you have to keep adding more and more gas as the evolution's gone on. Surely that's exactly as you would have expected, because a small galaxy is probably less likely to be able to pull in gas from other sources because it's got less of a presence. But, you know, relative to its own size, you know, the Milky Way might pull in 10% of its mass because that's a big, big lot of gas. But a little galaxy will pull in, a, you know, also pull in 10% of its mass. So you might expect this thing to kind of be scale invariant and they all ought to behave the same way. But it clearly doesn't seem to be the case. It really looks like the low mass galaxies, they've just had one load of gas and that was all they got. And they turned that into stars, whereas big galaxies like the Milky Way have been fed continuous stream of gas, which has allowed them to to make more and more higher metallicity stars. Although I talked about, you know, adding gas, it could be that that gas was already in a big galaxy like the Milky Way, it was already there. It just wasn't forming stars. It was just kind of hanging out in the outer parts of the galaxy. And then, you know, as the star formation was doing its thing, it would then start feeding it in. Whereas little galaxies, it looks like all the gas is involved in star formation all the time, which is another way of saying that it's much better mixed. Everything's all mixed up so that actually there isn't one load of gas over here, which is not forming stars and a load of gas over here that is forming stars. It's all all forming stars and all churning together. Professor, I don't know if it's because we're in lockdown, but at the moment when we're talking about this, all I'm thinking about is like, you know, ingredients and and sultanas and flour <laughs> and bakeries and things like that. Maybe I've made too many cakes in the last week or two. When you lay in bed and think about this stuff, you know, are you, are you, what scales and time scales are you thinking? Obviously, you're not thinking about it on galactic time scales because you'd have to lay in bed for 100,000 years or something. But <laughs> like, how do you imagine this stuff when you're lying in bed? Are you imagining all the graphs and the mathematics? Are you imagining the objects and things falling in, but just in fast forward? Like, what does that look like inside your head when you think about this? 
when you look at one of the simulations on the screen, right, where you see the whole thing nice and small and in fast forwards, you see it in your head as, as happening on human timescales, but then you just have to take that step back and say, but actually that process is taking hundreds of millions of years, not a few seconds. To be honest, the, the main time I stop and get awed by it is when I talk to you or, you know, when I give a popular talk or when I'm trying to explain it and suddenly you do have to take that step back and it's no longer, you know, that one with all those zeros that I just take for granted, suddenly you've got a whole bunch of people saying, well, that's an amazingly big number. And then you have to take that. Yeah, actually, you're quite right. It is an amazingly big number. There's also something about it, though, when you think about the reality of the size and more the time scale, while it is more awesome, it sort of becomes more boring. Is that fair? Like, it's almost like you think, well, yeah, that looks cool in a simulation. But in fact, that's just happening at something that beyond glacial like it's all just happening so slowly isn't that amazing in itself i think that's amazing that this this majestic scale of this thing right it's not you know it's a huge symphony that's going on it's not some little tune and actually the time it takes to unfold is enormously long i, I think that adds to the beauty of it not detracts from it it's all right if you've got long enough to sit around and watch it, but come on, we're in a hurry here. <laughs> We've got things to do. But that's the neat thing, right? Isn't it amazing that we can actually start to understand things which take hundreds of millions of years to happen? Right? It's quite amazing that a human mind, which, as you say, is kind of focused on things happening on timescales of hours, can actually comprehend things which take billions of years in some cases. I think that's pretty amazing, really. They use the super protons synchrotron collider at CERN, they had a, a beam of electrons of about 100 GeV. Some of these Lego bricks represent 100 kilometers on this map. To put some things into scale, first let's talk about airliners. So when we're on a commercial airliner, 